Coming up next on This Week in Computer Hardware, 10,000 RPMs. Can a one terabyte Velociraptor hang with an SSD? AMD drops prices and bundles free games with HD7900. Speaking of GPUs, where are the GTX 680s? Asus Z77 motherboard special, Intel's new affordable SSDs, cheap PSUs, touchscreen notebooks. We say wait for Windows 8. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love from people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at c a c h e f l y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 166, recorded April 19th, 2012. Hardware scumbags and missing GPUs. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show where we try to bring you the best and most exciting news in computer hardware, Apple computer hardware, and occasionally we dip into the tablets and the cell phones just because they're taking over that thing we call computing. I'm Patrick Norton, joined as always by Mr. Ryan Shrout. How are you today, sir? Um, I, I am on the kind of the edge of like four or five days of just like straight morning to late night sessions of testing and benchmarking. So I'm surprised I'm as awake and coherent as I am. Um, but uh, like we were talking about before the show started, doing a lot of coding, a lot of like Windows scripting of some things. And uh, it actually appears to be working. Uh, I, I can watch it from afar. And as long as that keeps doing things, I'll be happy. If I get Are up in the middle of the show and slam stuff down, you'll know why. <laughs> It's not you, Patrick, although it could be. So I, if I'm not mistaken, you are sort of hand piecing together an exciting new collection of benchmarks or automating, it's auto, like automating the, the, the execution of benchmarks, or is it something you cannot talk about? Uh, well, no, I can talk about that. So new processors are coming out, and we basically completely redid our CPU testbed. We removed a lot of things that were old and outdated. We updated some benchmarks. We added some new ones. And... Uh, you know, some tests you ha still have to run by hand. All the gaming tests and obviously anytime you do overclocking and feature testing and that kind of stuff. But a lot of the numbers benchmarking that we do, you know, running Cinebench, running Pavre, running Sandra, uh, running OpenCL tests, running 3D Marks, those types of things can all be automated to a certain degree. And then the idea is to try to write some scripts that are smart enough to automate all of those different automation scripts uh, so that, you know, I can have three test beds running benchmarks at the same time, making me a little bit more effective and hopefully cutting down on the amount of time it takes to, to benchmark things. It is a good thing to cut down on the time the benchmarks take. Yes, <laughs> yes. For your professional life, for your home life, for your sanity. <laughs> All of the above. Interesting thing topping off the news uh, today from PC Per Alan Malventano. We actually have an old school rotating platter we call them hard drives velociraptor of all things has hit <laughs> one terabyte the capacity we pretty much don't see in consumer ssds ten thousand rpms and you know i i all i could think of is remember like the first 10 and fifty thousand rpm drives they were amazingly fast they were amazingly cool they sounded like a jet engine turbine spinning yeah. up before takeoff and this is really interesting because uh Western Digital produces Velociraptors. They pretty much pop out a new one every two years. Last one we saw was, I want to say, 600 gigabytes, um, 300 gigabytes two years before that. And now it is one terabyte. And if we take a look at the, uh, uh, it's just a massive beast. It seems like so much of this hard drive is pretty much a big, massive heat sink slash enclosure, um, <laughs> which mm -hmm. I believe that is the ice pack cooler. Um, and it's a pretty interesting idea. So, you know. Uh, these will likely be available without the ice pack cooler, but only for dedicated enterprise rack mount applications where cooling is a plenty. So basically that big giant black chunk of hardware around there is a big heat sink for your hard drives. Um, and as you'd kind of expect, they are fast. 
They do really yeah. cool things. You know, it's command queuing, no just ramp load technology, perpendicular magnetic recording, no shock there, vertical alignment of bits that's been around for a while. Uh, rate specific time limited error recovery. So basically, it keeps it from hanging too long and screwing up rate functions. Uh, rotary acceleration feed forward. The rotary acceleration feed forward takes the input from sensors mounted on the drive chassis and uses that data to help keep the head on track. Memory path protection, uh, advanced formatting, which basically. Uh, um, allows uh, the drive to handle data as 4K internal blocks. Um, and where did we go? Um, there it I is. I didn't go anywhere. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I got a little distracted by a couple of the, the uh, controllers. Um, outstanding sequential read and write speeds. No big shock there. Best IOPS we've seen out of a spinning disk to date. For a non-hybrid, i.e. non-big chunk of memory, uh, industry-leading five-year warranty, which is great. Go Western Digital. Cons, quote, hard disk drives generally struggle to match the thousands of IOPS capable of modern SSDs. As good as it is, the VR just doesn't come close, excuse me, just can't come close to solid state. Um, that said, it's true. <laughs> Uh, you know, when you take a look at the uh, Velociraptor's costs per gigabyte, the one terabyte Velociraptor sells for 320 bucks. That's 32 cents a gigabyte versus, say, oh, an OCZ Vertex 4, which it maxes out at 512 gigabytes and sells for $1.37 a gigabyte or uh, $700, twice as much money for half, more than twice as much money for half as much storage, but faster storage. So. Yeah, so there, there's there's like an interesting split here on people th that are more excited about the release of a one terabyte Velociraptor and those that are maybe kind of lukewarm to it. I find myself to be more on uh, the excited side about it, just just mainly because you're, you're four times less expensive or, you know, a quarter of the price of, of the, you know, the kind of the most modestly priced SSDs unless you're talking about specials and sales. And you're getting a one terabyte capacity that is really, really hard to find. Uh, you know, 320 bucks for one terabyte drive. You know, Alan was talking on the podcast last night, and, and there's a couple of graphs that we showed that um, when, you imp when you include even a single solid state drive in your latency tests, it's not even close, right? It's the difference between zero milliseconds and 12 or eight milliseconds, right? You're talking about a huge, a huge difference in, in the, you know, the responsiveness of the drives. Um, so I, I think kind of the market for these Velociraptor drives has kind of shrunk quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, but I still, I still, I don't know. I still feel like I have several machines here that are running on 160 gig or 120 gig SSDs simply because of cost concerns, right? We've got a lot of machines running and I don't feel like putting 300 gig and above SSDs in all of them. And we kind of get to the issue where uh, we're kind of full. Actually, our main video editing rig has, I think, a pair of SSDs in a RAID 1 and they're 160 gigs or something like that. And so every once in a while, we have to make sure we clean everything up, clean up the Adobe uh, cache files and all that kind of stuff to, to make sure we have enough space. And with a one terabyte drive, we wouldn't really have that issue. Um, mm -hmm. Ideally, what I really want is a one terabyte SSD for three hundred dollars. <laughs> I was waiting for that. <laughs> now that's that's not what they're offering, but uh, it's it's the fastest spindle-based hard drive you can get, and it's if you you think about it, it's about half the capacity. I would consider two terabyte drives to be the mainstream drive now. Kind of like the if you're going to buy storage drives, you should probably buy two terabyte hard drives today in terms of cost per gigabyte and that kind of stuff. So we're all, you're going down by a factor of two there. You're going down to half that. But one terabyte is still a lot of data. Um, so I don't know. I, I'll be very curious when these come out, when they're actually for sale, just how well received they are. Because I think enthusiasts uh, and gamers have really had uh, an attachment to SSDs since they've been released. And I don't, I don't know if this is going to be enough to, to kind of pull them back into the world of just super fast hard drives. I thought it was really curious because, uh, you know, one, I, I, I don't know if I missed it in the review, but did Alan mention anything maybe on the podcast last night about what the noise considerations were with this drive? Because whenever I think of Velociraptor, I think of unbelievably fast and I think of really weird sounds coming from my computer. Um, um, I, have it, I, I don't remember him saying anything about that specifically, so it must not have been a major issue. Um, right. I mean, you're still talking about the same number of platters spinning at the same speed, so it's not going to be different than the 600 gig version. Right. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't really have any problems with the noise levels of the of the 600 gig and the 300 gig of the last generation 
of of velociraptors. It's I, I think it was really cool just to take a, to see the the evolution of these drives because keep in mind these when this came out at the thirty six gigabyte version of it, it was basically a high end server SKU that they just kind of remarketed towards enthusiasts, and it's still basically that product now. Um, it, it's just cool to have seen it progress from thirty six up to one terabyte, still maintaining that ten thousand RPM speed, uh, while most right. traditional hard drives today are actually going less than 7,200. Yeah, I mean, and you start thinking about that as, as something people don't think about as much anymore. As, as you increase the aerial density on the platter, you're effectively moving more data under the head for the same given rotational speed because the bits are packed that much more tightly together. It was interesting. One of the things that really struck me um, is one of the notes Alan makes in the setup is that uh, he basically warns against using the Marvell 6 gigabit per second controllers and drivers uh, if you have the option of using native Intel uh, controllers. Quote, we've seen as much as 15% drops in write speeds in some instances with the Marvell controller paired to high-end hard disk drives for some benchmarks. Mm -hmm. That was comparing to a 3 gigabyte per second native controller. So... If you can, you know, if you're going to spend the money on one of these drives, you want to make sure you have a native Intel controller on your motherboard or pop for a new motherboard that's got, uh, that, that can take advantage of the full performance of the drive. The, um, last, the last thing I'll say is uh, looking at the cost per gigabyte, let's say $1.30 for SSDs, kind of on the low end of SSDs. We're talking, what, 30-something cents, 37 cents for these new one terabyte drives, 32 cents, 32 cents at the one gigabyte. terabyte. Uh, if you get a regular Western Digital Caviar Green two terabyte hard drive for 129 bucks, you're talking about six and a half cents per gigabyte. Wow. So there's even a pretty there's even a really, really dramatic jump going from the Velociraptor down to, you know, your traditional spinning hard drive that is not performance conscious, but just capacity conscious. So the cool hey, hard drive prices always- are low again. So there you go. <laughs> That's a good thing. Are they as low as they were though? Will they drop lower? Oh my goodness. GTX 680, two gigabytes graphics card review. Are they actually available for sale? And what do you think of the two terabyte, excuse me, the two gigabyte, the two terabyte memory cards? Um, That'd be really that'd be impressive. Awesome. Yeah. Wouldn't be able to use it. Um, you know, we, we did a review of the Galaxy GTX 680. It's not any different than the, the original 680 that we, that we saw in March. It's basically a reference card with a different sticker and that kind of stuff on it. Um, performance is still great. Power efficiency is still great. We really, 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 really like this product. It's still not available in any kind of mass way. Um, just, you know, we, we we published the article, I think, on Tuesday. We did the podcast on Wednesday, and, and we're recording this show on Thursday. And still, uh, I'm looking on Newegg.com, and there are no GTX 680s in stock. It's really, really, really disappointing. Now, when we ask NVIDIA, they say, well, there's just so much demand. Uh, we can't possibly keep up with the demand. It's hard to really know the truth um, because their partners aren't really saying a lot. You know, the resellers aren't really selling, saying a lot uh, about, you know, how many we got in initially versus how many they've sold since. The, 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 the best thing you can do is if you're trying to get a hold of these cards is sign up for one of these auto notify services through like Newegg or Amazon or something that will, you know, let you know when one's in stock. And hopefully you can be, you know, quick enough on your phone or on your computer to actually go through and buy it. Um, I, I said this previously, and, and I guess I'll reiterate it again. NVIDIA could have sold this card for $599. I think it's really obvious now. They could have sold this card for $599 instead of $499, and they would have sold out of all their cards. Um, right. So there's something to be said for them not doing that, essentially. right? They, they, they have, in my opinion, the best product, and they had the best pricing when it came out. So it's not often you get both of those, right? AMD did that uh, in the 5000 series uh, of their Radeon cards, and it, was, it, was, it changed the way things worked. But those were, you could buy them. They were in stock. They didn't sell out for the entire first month of, uh, of the card's availability. And I think it's really hindering NVIDIA's ability to kind of capitalize on all of the, the great stories and the great press that the 680 launch brought forth. When you can read about it all you want, and I'm ta- you know, we talked about the Galaxy card that I just reviewed. But if you can't buy it, it doesn't do us any good to write about it. It doesn't do, doesn't do Galaxy any good for us to review it. It doesn't do NVIDIA any good because they're not making any money. If anything, they're making enemies because of it. 
And the enemies are not what anybody in the graphics card universe needs right now. No. So that kind of brings us to an interesting story. Yeah, I'm sitting here and, and we're talking about this and I'm immediately typing into new egg HD 7900 because HD's dropped the HD, excuse me, uh, AMD's dropped the price in the 7900 and they've started bundling free games with them. It looks like Dirt Showdown, uh, Next You Is, and Deus Ex Human Revolution. Um, free game bundled with your GPU, uh, the Radeon HD 7950 now 399, the 7970 now 479. Uh, basically, three free games with an HD 7900, is that right? Yeah, that's, that's what you're getting. Um, so we're seeing, effective from the MSRP, a $70 price drop on the, on the highest-end SKU from AMD, the Radeon HD 7970, which is, which is really, really nice. It puts it $20 less than the lowest-cost GTX 680s, which, um, you know, performance still leans towards the NVIDIA card. Uh, so $20 lower price probably isn't enough to, to, to get the, those people that might be on the fence of, of which vendor they're going to buy. But you throw mm -hmm. in Dirt Showdown, Deus Ex Human Revolution, which was a great game, and uh, it includes the the DLC as well, as well as a game that I can't pronounce. Uh, <laughs> I feel next, better now. Next, next was, I, I, I had never heard of this before, but, um, you know, at least two titles, Dirt Showdown, Deus Ex, that are, that are major releases that you're going to get for free. Uh, and then, of course, the Radeon 7950, which is the next step down, also got a $50 price cut. So these are these are kind of the price cuts that we thought we were going to see when the 680 launched initially. Uh, I don't know if AMD maybe kind of sat back and said, we're going to see what the reception is to the 680. We're going to, maybe they weren't 100% sure about what the performance was actually going to be on that card. Let's not throw away money yet. Uh, they, they seem to have uh, seen the results. Maybe they saw sales slow. Uh, people are buying the 680 or waiting for the 680 to get in stock, and they're hoping that these price drops kind of change that. I think it's a very compelling option now if you're a high-end gamer to get a Radeon HD 7970, especially considering you can buy it today. You don't mm -hmm. have to wait, right? You can click the button and put it in your cart and, and check out, and then you'll get these three games free. Um, I, you know, as if you, especially if you don't have either of them, it's, and Deus Ex is a great game. I, never, I don't think Dirt Showdown is actually out yet. I don't, I don't right. know for sure. Um, but yes, AMD finally kind of made the move that we had expected them to make. So I, I, I think that's good. I, this is what we want from the graphics card market. Right? We want competition. <laughs> we want NVIDIA to come out with its card at a lower price that's going to force AMD to come out at, uh, to, to lower its price. And then maybe we'll see... Um, you know, the rest of the 600 series from NVIDIA come out and kind of push that, push that market around a little bit more. That's as gamers and enthusiasts and people that are buying stuff. That's what we want to see. Dirt Showdown, by the way, hits the streets May 25th. And yes, I agree. I want to see death battles on prices. I just want to see the death battles take out NVIDIA or AMD. Um, I'm actually starting to get really excited about a motherboard of all things. Not really a new processor. I don't see a huge performance boost that I can actually use between the 920 sure. and the current round of, of Core i7s, but the uh, Z77 motherboards um, are really starting to look interesting, and you got to sort of do a live review and take a look at what's going on with the Asus Z77 motherboards. What's yeah, you know, if I, had, if I had planned this better, I would have bought all of the motherboards out here just to show you. I mean, we went through... Uh, just a torture JJ, JJ from Asus came by, brought a ton of products. Uh, we did a live showcase uh, on on uh, just on the streaming service uh, at pcpro.com slash live. And we, you know, had chat room going and Twitter and that kind of stuff going. We got to ask questions and answer questions through, uh, through, the, through, the, through the video feed. It actually went really well. We looked at basically every motherboard they're going to have available uh, in the next month or so. Um, from a, a, a mini ITX, mini ITX Z77 motherboard that is fully featured with USB 3, a full-size PCI Express slot, uh, great overclocking capability as well. Uh, we looked at the micro ATX, we looked at the full-size ATX, we looked at like uh, the Maximus 5 gene and formula boards um, that uh, you know, are, are kind of like the, the, the high-end enthusiast overclocking gaming level. We looked at the one on the video feed here is the Sabertooth that has uh, extra, uh, you know, uh, cooling capability and kind of stability and long-term life built into it. That's what it's kind of built for. And they, 
besides just the hardware, so the major change in the Z77 chipset, there's not a whole lot different. The major change is the integration of an Intel-based USB 3.0 controller in the chipset. That's kind of like really the only major change in the chipset logic itself. Right. And it performs well. It, it outperforms um, some of the, the, the external chip, third-party controller-based USB solutions, mo- mainly because the integrated controller has a direct access line to the processor. Everybody else has to go through a PCI Express interface. So it has an advantage there. But what I was more impressed with is I came away with uh, the, the features, the kind of the software features that ASUS has built on their combination hardware software. My favorite of which is a, an updated version of Fan Expert, which is kind of like their fan management uh, configuration software. So you're going to have, you, you have four fan headers on every motherboard that are going to be controllable uh, throughout throughout this this fan expert software that has really cool features like you know when you're when you're plugging in your system you just kind of you you know you plug your fan into the closest header on the motherboard right and you just want to make sure that they all have power connections and they're all spinning well on the software in windows you have the capability to uh, basically search through each fan so it will you know turn on only one fan and you can look and see which fan it is that's running and you can label that in the software and then you can control it Accordingly, you can set custom fan curves, you can set custom temperature values and everything very easily through um, a well-designed UI. And I think it, you probably have this experience in the past too. You know, if you look at, let me say, three years ago and at any time before that, if you try to use the software that came with your motherboard, it was almost always a train wreck. And they have done a very good job of cleaning that up, kind of consolidating it, uh, implementing a lot of cool features, and just making it easy to use as opposed to you've got this monitoring application that's bl- bright red and it's got a dragon on it, but then you've got this uh, this BIOS update utility that is a giant blue orb that takes up three three quarters of your screen for no purpose because it has a search button and, a, and an update button, right? And those kinds of things. And that has kind of been fixed and updated. And uh, it, the videos on there are, I think, with total of two and a half hours, almost three hours of content. So if you... If you were like Patrick and you were curious about uh, the Z77 <laughs> motherboards and maybe specifically the features that the uh, ASUS lineup are, uh, are bringing to it, you can see there. You can see in that video there, we're actually showing the fan demonstration. We had all four fans um, taped to the table so that you could see when they spin down and when they spin up and that kind of stuff. So you can see they'll actually, uh, the software will learn the low RPM and the high RPM for each individual fan. If you don't know it, it will, you know, so it have the finer grain control over uh, your noise levels and that kind of stuff. It's, it's, it's pretty interesting. It's pretty interesting. It's worth, it's worth a view. That is pretty cool. I actually, it's kind of funny. It's just so weird to me to be more excited about motherboards right now that I am about CPUs. Uh, I would agree. I would agree. <laughs> it's not, it's not what a lot of people were expecting. I think the mother it's, we're at the point, motherboards are everybody assumes all motherboards are the same at this point and i think uh asus msi gigabyte all those guys know that they know that they assume or all the readers all the buyers assume that every motherboard is going to be the same it's just a matter of what processor you put in it what video cards you put in it and so they're trying desperately to differentiate and uh, asus was was proud enough of their stuff and confident enough in their uh, abilities that they built onto these boards to come here and do it all live i mean all the demos we did were live so if they screwed up they screwed up for everybody to see and that takes that takes a lot of guts uh, for a company to do that right so absolutely speaking of guts uh, or chutzpah or words that we don't say on family shows nvidia is teasing <laughs> another graphics card you can't really buy a gtx 680 or a 680 gtx uh GTA, uh, yeah, it's, it's okay. So we can barely find a GTX 680 unless maybe they're showing up <laughs> for like onesie, twosie, like three show up on Amazon and four at Newegg and they get snapped up before anybody can find them. But we're going to give NVIDIA the benefit of the doubt because we're gracious that way. Facebook.com slash NVIDIA GeForce. They are teasing in the vaguest terms possible another uh, an upcoming graphics card. There's about uh, pretty much all it says, right? There's a picture yes. of something that could definitely be a cover on a graphics card. The title, it's coming, and no clue about what it is. Could be a Kepler based graphics card. Uh, you know, uh, something higher end. Nobody knows what it is. What? what Nobody what's your knows best? for sure. Well, there's uh, there's yeah. two options, right? So it's either uh, like the dual GPU version. GTX 690, we're guessing it's going to be called, or it's 
you know, the the 670 or the 660, kind of like uh, the less expensive, more mainstream version of the card. Um, but a, a, if you look through the comments on our site and uh, even a lot of the comments on the Facebook page, you'll see that that uh, what people are hoping is that it's actually like maybe product availability of the GTX 680 itself. It's kind of a joke. But, uh, you know, it, it, NVIDIA, if nothing else, does a very good job of doing marketing and promotion. So they will... Um, they will tease people to their heart's content. Uh, you know, personally, I hope it's a, a dual GPU card because I just want to see, I don't want to see more expensive video cards, but I want to see more powerful <laughs> video cards. Let's, let's say that. Maybe and they're going to announce that the channel is full. <laughs> you could buy yeah. a GTX 680 now because we actually made a bunch more of them. If, if they put their dual GPU card out before AMD, I think that's a right. That's a fairly big deal, you know, availability concerns notwithstanding, because AMD talked about, uh, I mean, we heard about their New Zealand product, the, the dual GPU 7990 or whatever, when mm -hmm. the 7900s were first reviewed in December, right? So uh, it's been a while for that. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I can think you, it'll, I think it'll be interesting. Can you buy a 7900 right now? A 79, uh, you can buy a 7970. But you can't right. buy 7990. 7990s were never even kind of released yet. I guess what I mean is like, you know, if NVIDIA releases a GPU, if, if NVIDIA releases a new GPU and they put like 500 of them in the channel and they sell out and then they right. tell you that they won't tell you how many they sold and they won't tell you the availability and they won't tell you they're not available, but they will tell you to, that you should keep an eye open because they are available. <laughs> have they really released a, a dual part or have they just made a, you know, sort of a pre, you know what I mean? Like there's some announcements you make because you actually have a product and there's some announcements you want to make so that it sounds like you invented, you know, you released that product first, even though right. your competitor actually shipped that product first. There, there's definitely the capability of that. They could, they could announce a dual GPU card next week and say, and it'll be available June 15th. But hey, we talked about it first. And we, hopefully we don't see that. Nobody likes those. But <laughs> I guess NVIDIA would. So We like cheap SSDs. Yes. We like even better inexpensive SSDs from reliable manufacturers. We thought it walked away from right. the consumer market. Like Intel's new. 330 series SSDs. This is actually really interesting. They basically, because we talked about this a few a few months ago, a few weeks ago, it all blurs together, um, where it sounded like Intel had pretty much been like, hey, we've jump-started this whole SSD thing. We're going to do some more high-end drives. All the rest of you can go out and fight over for the rest of the market while we look for our, you know, 4,000% margins. And then out of the blue, the 330 series, um, Quote, might help future Ultrabook models dip below the $1,000 mark while keeping the speed of an SSD, uh, like a buck fifty gigabyte on a 60 gigabyte drive. Uh, and the price drop, the price per gigabyte drops as you go to the 120 gigabyte and 180 gigabyte model. So, you know, no 256, 512 gigabyte screamers, but you're also looking at a decent sized uh, solid state drive for 250 bucks. That's exciting. Uh, yeah, especially and, and you, and you kind of mentioned at the people. beginning, right? Because when it's in... It, maybe it's unfair to everybody else. When you see the Intel name on it, you kind of you kind of assume that it's going to be a little bit better vetted. Uh, this is still the same Sandforce controller that many other people are using. Um, so, you know, w hopefully we won't see any problems with this drive. But uh, anytime we can see lower prices, more more options, I am I am definitely for it. Uh, what well, they only go up to 180 gigs, so we're still we're still short of my uh, one terabyte drive for 300 bucks. Well, you know, maybe you just assemble five of these into a raid. <laughs> hopefully we'll still be doing this show when the one terabyte $300 SSD comes out so that we can celebrate. Maybe have a little party or something. I think we should really celebrate the $200 one terabyte SSD. Okay. That'll be the one to party for, man. <laughs> Is it worth partying for the Windows 8? No, excuse me. Sorry. For Windows 8 SKUs. <laughs> I don't... <laughs> I don't know. Um, I thought so we were going to have like did seven you... different well, that's what we're used to. breeds of Windows 8. But now it's Windows 8, Windows 8 Pro, Windows RT, previously known as Windows on ARM. And the quote, the fourth SKU will be Windows 8 Enterprise. And it will take all the features of Windows 8 Pro and then sprinkle in some IT management and volume licensing goodies to keep the majority of their customers, a.k.a. businesses, happy. Are we excited? Are you excited? No. Is Windows 8 <laughs> Do you have, do you, are you still running Windows 8 on any machine in your life right now? I am not. I am not running Windows 8 on any machine. And let me, 
I feel a little guilty about it, to be completely honest with you, because I'm so ingrained on making sure that the hardware, I deal with bleeding edge hardware, and I need to make sure that the software underneath it is 100% before, you know, I can claim that any kind of hardware is. So I tend, you know, we're not going to put Windows 8 on our main CPU test bed or our GPU test bed or anything like that, but right. I do feel guilty that we do not have Windows 8 running on some system here just for frequent use and interaction. <laughs> Uh, but I'm running I, I, Windows 8 on two of my systems, so I, I oh, feel okay. warm and fuzzy and bleeding edge. Unlike you, trailing edge slacker, who's running more you expensive only hardware. Than this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, so what do we well, what do we take about the the fewer SKUs? I think it's smart. I, I think I, I think the majority is that was a reaction to. I, I, let me rephrase this. I will brazenly assume that was a reaction to, you know the. The basically everybody going, oh my god, you're not going to do this again. We don't need 17 versions of Windows. Just delete expletive, make it simple. Um, because that was just kind of completely ridiculous when they start, you know, we're going to do Windows Home, then we're going to do Windows Minus, then we're going to do Windows Emerging Country Edition, then the Windows Emerging Country Edition with additional subsidies to compete with Linux Edition, and then we're also going to have the Windows Home Edition with Plus, the Plus Edition with More, the More Edition with Pro, and the Pro Edition, which really doesn't do anything useful for professionals available for the enterprise market, not to be confused with Windows Enterprise. You know what I mean? And you start hammering your head against the nearest object because you're like, what is the point of this? So, okay, Windows RT, um, which probably makes more sense than ARM if you're in marketing, uh, than Windows yeah. 8 ARM edition, right? Because they're, you know, Windows RT, Windows recursive travel, Windows whatever <laughs> RT stands for. Um, I don't know. And then the three versions that we actually care about, which is Windows 8, Windows 8 Pro, or the two versions we actually care about. Um, yep. And it's interesting, like Windows 8 upgrades from Windows 7 Starter, Home Basic, Home Premium. Uh, Windows 8 Pro upgrades from Windows 7 Professional and Ultimates. Um, do, 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 do. Everything gets the Windows Store. Everything gets the Start Screen, Semantic Zoom, Live Tiles. Uh, Windows RT, of course, because it doesn't run on x86. And x86 apps won't run on Windows RT on ARM. One that won't right. run on Windows RT, period, is getting Microsoft Office. They all get Internet Explorer 10. RT gets device encryption. They all get connected standby. They also get a Microsoft account. They also get a desktop, um, mm -hmm. you know. And it's kind of funny, like Smart Screen, Windows Defender, all the basics are there. Storage spaces, Windows Media Player show up in the x86 versions, but not the RT versions. And it's just kind of a weird little list of stuff. You know, Windows Pro, basically BitLocker, boot from VHD, client Hyper-V, domain join, encrypting file system, group policy, and remote desktop. So basically, unless you're a security nerd or have a really interesting setup on your home network, um, very few people in our home user audience are going to be looking at Windows 8 Pro. The people in IT in the audience yeah. may be considered for, uh, especially for mobile clients. Um, the ability to encrypt the hard drive on the fly is really, really nice if you run with a crowd of people that carry around notebooks and have important corporate data on there. Or even data you just think is important, <laughs> even if it's not really. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be, I don't know, it's going to be interesting. Actually, I'm, I'm liking Windows 8 more and more. There's some stuff that I find uh, with the tile. It's kind of, it's been interesting to watch some of my super nerdy friends who are kind of like, you know, fully life hacker oriented where they've kind of configured every aspect of, of Windows 7 to, you know, maximize their efficiency, just going absolutely berserk with hatred. Uh, over Windows 8, over many features that will actually sort of, you know, improve over time, like, you know, having custom tiles for your favorite applications that aren't weird things that came, you know, pre-bundled from Microsoft or or just being really frustrated that, that Microsoft had the audacity to challenge the interface. Um, I think it's going to be a really, really interesting launch, and I'm really curious to see how the general population embraces this. If there's a big rush to move to Windows 8 or if everybody looks at it and goes, what is this thing? Uh, well, we'll have a question about that later in the show, talking about kind of like touchscreen <laughs> laptops and that kind of stuff. So, touch your it laptop. It will be a dramatic shift. Let's take a quick break here before we actually get to those emails and thank today's podcast sponsor. Uh, you guys know them. You love them. If you don't have this installed on your PC, your phone, your tablet, your game console, then you are missing out. That's right. Netflix is our sponsor again this week, guys. Uh, Netflix streaming service allows you to stream thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to you instantly, saving you time, money, and hassle. You don't have to drive to the store. You don't have to drive to the grocery store to put that DVD back into that 
square box out by the exit. <laughs> um, you can watch them pretty much wherever you're at on pretty much a lot of devices. I almost said pretty much any device. It's not true, but on a lot of devices, a lot more than you may think, actually. Uh, if you want to watch Netflix movies and TV shows on your Mac or your PC, that's super easy to do. You just go to the, uh, their website. You can watch on your iPad. You can watch on your iPhone. Uh, lots and lots of Android devices now support the Netflix streaming application as well. Now, if you want to watch it on your TV, a more traditional viewing experience, you can absolutely do that through a gaming console like the 360 or the PS3 or the Nintendo Wii. You can get a Roku box. You can get an Apple TV. Many TVs, DVD players, Blu-ray players already support Netflix. So uh, check your manuals, check your boxes, check for logos on your, on your uh, consumer electronics. They may already support streaming Netflix. Now, one of the best features of Netflix is obviously you can, you can watch these shows as many times as you want. Uh, over and over again, if that's if that's your deal, if you are one of the people that used to just wear out VHS tapes, you're going to love Netflix because you're going to be able to stream these shows and movies over and over again. Also, the ability uh, to kind of have like a DVR type service where you can start watching a show in one location and finish watching it in a different one. If you're watching uh, a movie downstairs on on the living room or on the couch in the living room, you can. Stop it, go upstairs and finish it on your iPad while you lay in bed. And you can do that while you're traveling to work the next day on the bus or on the train. And that type of kind of everything everywhere mentality is really what makes Netflix a, a, a great service. So whichever way you choose to access Netflix, you can watch as many movies and TV shows as you want anytime. And you can cancel at any time if you aren't happy with it. Now, to try it out, all you have to do, you get 30 days completely free if you go to Netflix dot com slash twit t w i t netflix dot com slash twit be sure to use that url when you sign up it helps us it helps you and uh we really think you're gonna love uh, the streaming service from netflix so uh, we thank netflix for their support of this week in computer hardware Woo-hoo. thank you netflix i was watching netflix last night it makes me happy <laughs> so it's a, a little tiny baby got a really good car and and i'm going to lean on you for the answer to this question because i was just thinking about this because i read this one last week uh daniel's got a question he says listening to twitch has been a part of my saturday morning routine since episode one and i love it very cool daniel i've been putting together my own pcs for the better part of the last 20 plus years and an increasingly busy schedule has kept me out of the loop as far as hardware news goes but your podcast solves that very nicely and thanks to you guys i still feel like i'm pumped i'm on top of things even if i can't read I don't recall that you've ever really talked much about virtualization. While I realize it's not necessarily something for the average home user, your target audience consists of hardcore hardware geeks and hobbyists that might want to know more about it. And there are important decisions to make when it comes to purchasing hardware before committing to VMware, Hyper-V, VirtualBox, and the like. For example, Microsoft's Hyper-V requires a CPU that supports hardware virtualization, and Hyper-V is not available to Windows 7, although it is coming to the Windows 8 client. I'm thinking that a discussion on the hardware involved in putting together a kick-ass VM host without breaking the bank would make for an interesting show. It's interesting. I I have dealt with a lot of virtualization on the server side uh, when we talk about hosting of the website and all that kind of stuff. But we've never, I've never really done any kind of commercial end user virtualization. Now we had an article we talked about on here a little bit when the windows eight, uh, Consumer Preview first came out, and we talked about uh, some free virtualization software that you could get, set up a a little uh, virtual machine on your own computer to install Windows 8 so you didn't have to kind of overwrite your Windows 7 and all that kind of stuff. But you could still have the ability to experience Windows 8 in an almost native environment. Uh, Alan, who does our storage stuff, knows a lot more about virtualization. He handles that for a lot uh, for his other job, his day job, (laughs) and uh, does a lot of that at his home as well. I think it's actually a really good topic. The problem Mm -hmm. is, is kind of as he mentions here, talking about the differences in the different hypervisors, uh, support for Microsoft versus support for VMware, and and, um, even as each processor generation has come out, we see support for different features in those in the in that processor hardware and a lot of it uh, i think users would be surprised that you have to have extremely low level hardware support for virtualization for some specific features of virtualization right, right? um but i i don't have the answers for daniel here now in terms of um building that kick-ass vm host on a budget but i think it's definitely something we can look at and i don't yeah. think it'll take too much research for us to do that 
And I'm thinking in the coming weeks, I'll have extra free time to, <laughs> to do that kind of stuff. So I'd also like to that. invite anybody, especially in the IT side of the audience, um, to comment on this because virtual machines are really fascinating. If you've never heard the concept before, um, a virtual machine is essentially an entire operating system that's running discreetly inside your operating system. And people use them for, you know, when they're coding, when they're testing hardware. Uh, on, they're used a lot in servers when you w- want to create sort of a hosted operating system that runs a service so that it won't corrupt the other operating system. It allows you to basically do more things with a single CPU. Um, you know, and it gets really weird really, really quickly. Um, you know, you've got, you know, Parallels is one of the most commonly known one. Uh, Oracle's uh, virtual box, which was Sun's virtual box, which is, uh, I want to say, is that open source? Yeah, Microsoft Windows, Mac OS X, Linux, and Solaris. And it's, yeah, GNU General Public License version 2.0. Virtualbox.org is the website for that one. Uh, VMware being sort of the, the primary commercial one out there. And it's, you know, they've changed, especially Parallels and VMware have changed a lot over the last five years. Um, and VirtualBox is really cool because you essentially have this unspeakably sophisticated chunk of software that's available for free. Um, so if you have yeah. been thinking about, you know, the idea of, you know, okay, I'd like I want to run a Windows application inside of Parallels, inside my OS X installation because there's this Windows app I want to run that I can't get on OS X. Um, you might want to think about uh, taking a look at VirtualBox for that. But... It gets really interesting really, really quickly. That was, my, that was my first experience with the virtualization was Parallels <laughs> when I bought an iMac. And then eventually I realized that all of the applications I was running were in Windows in Parallels on Mac OS. And I went, nah, this is a total waste of time. And I went back to just using Windows. <laughs> um, but but the, the idea of using VMs on your, on your home system is it, a good way when we talk about having an eight core processor with 16 threads and 32 gigs of memory. Well, maybe now you can do lots of virtual machines uh, to run different servers, to run different, you know, interfaces. You can have remote desktops for three different people all running off of the same machine. It can, can be, can be be pretty compelling as well. So Uh, let's take, um, we got an email from Andrew about PCI versions. I assume we're talking about PCI express here. I'm looking at getting a GeForce GTX 680, mostly for the power consumption and graphics improvements to replace my 460. My questions lie in the specs. I notice on the NVIDIA site it requires PCI Express 3.0 slot, and my motherboard is the ASUS Crosshair 5 formula, which only has 2.0 slots. What do I do? Also, I have a Corsair AX750 power supply. Uh, I would love to hear your guys' thoughts on this. Uh, First, in the power supply, that's going to be more than enough for a single GPU, and I would even go as far as say you could probably do two GPUs with that, depending on what your processor power consumption and if you have any other devices in your computer. Uh, You do not need to have a PCI Express 3.0 slot to run a GTX 680. Um, I'm guessing that it says it will support PCI Express 3.0, but it doesn't require it. You can absolutely run a GTX 680 on your motherboard and it's not going to cause any any performance penalties or any compatibility issues at all, actually. Uh, and in a lot of cases with our X79 motherboards, when we were doing initial testing of uh, PCI Express 3.0 cards, like the 7900 cards, we mm-hmm. actually downgraded them back to 2.0 because we we're having some compatibility issues because it was such a new technology at the time. So um, keep in mind that the first the first processor to support PCI Express 3.0 will be coming out this month. They're not, like, Sandy Bird G has support for it, but the X79 chipset kind of does. Like, it's it never was actually officially validated by Intel. All the motherboard manufacturers will claim 3.0 support, and it does work. It functions perfectly fine. Um, but... You don't have to have 3.0 to get a 680 to work or to get a Radeon HD 7900 or 7000 series card to work at all. So you'll be good. Yay. It's always a fun thing. Joe's got a question about Phenom and Bulldozer. He says, hey, guys, love the show. Thank you, Joe. You guys were talking about Bulldozer the other day and how the best Phenom 2 parts are pretty close in terms of performance. So I was wondering why didn't AMD move the Phenom 2 parts to a newer, smaller process tech and keep moving forward? Is that basically the A-series chips? I guess I just need to upgrade my motherboard. Um, (laughs) Well, how do we define the concept of the APU versus the CPU, the importance of the GPU, the declining importance of the GPU for the individual (laughs) desktop user, and the simple fact that sometimes you just can't shrink a design much farther without a lot of suffering? 
So um. I think I, the, the Phenom 2 turned out to be a really, really good part compared to Bulldozer. Um, and we see this again because I had to set uh, a 990 FX motherboard back up because I, we're talking about we were redoing all of our CPU benchmarks. So I had to retest quite a few CPUs, including the, the FX8150 Bulldozer and the Phenom 2 X6-1100T six-core processor. And so it basically comes down to the AMD engineers decided that the, bull, that the, the underlying idea of the architecture and Bulldozer was better um, for more workloads over the long run. Now, mm-hmm. Intel has the capability, the engineering resources and the money to probably have three major architectures kind of going through the pipeline at the same time. And if something just horrible happens to one, it can't scale to where they need it to scale, they can maybe shift over relatively quickly to a different design. AMD doesn't really necessarily have that advantage. Um, so Locked. they put all their bets in with the bulldozer architecture. That's what they spent their time developing on. And as it turned out, it wasn't able to scale to the clock speeds they needed it to get to in order for it to compete with even their own Phenom 2 designs. So uh, going back, I'm thinking maybe they would have cha- done things a little bit differently. I, you know, I, I can't say for sure it's, you know, Plus, a lot of the people that made those decisions at AMD and no longer work at AMD. So um, they could have done it. They could have made it a smaller process. They could have kept moving that design forward. Uh, but they thought they were doing the right thing, right thing by changing the architecture and going in a different route with the whole bulldozer module, uh, shared resources type of thing. And it may still turn out that that is the best answer for maybe server workspaces in the long term, uh, even though it is not proving to be very useful in the short term. Uh, the A-series Lano chips and the upcoming Trinity chips, um, Lano was based on the Phenom architecture. Trinity is not based on the Phenom architecture. It is based on the bulldozer architecture. So uh, the in the A-series is not faster than the Phenom 2X6 either. So if you're looking for the best performing AMD processor, it's still the Phenom 2X6, but you can't buy that anymore. So bulldozer, right? I mean, uh, the APU is, is a totally different design choice, right? That's if, if you want CPU, you know, moderate CPU performance and, and great integrated graphics performance, that's your, that's your route. And I think the APU makes a lot of sense going forward for these kind of split workloads. But uh, for just for raw CPU performance, the FX8150 is still the fastest currently available AMD part. So... There you have it. I don't know what else to say. Uh, they, they could be good or bad, so we'll uh, yeah. we'll see. It, you know, you you make your best guess based on the resources available, and then you hope the company survives. Yeah. Um, and I'm not trying to be a jerk when I say that. I mean, it's it's. I can't imagine trying to compete with Intel uh, on that kind of scale, especially in, in the CPU market. Joel's got a question about packed-in power supply units. I've heard you say before not to cheap out on a power supply. I'm wondering if you think it's okay to use the power supply that comes with the PC case. I'm mildly thinking of building a home server and would like to keep costs down, but I don't want to use a junk PSU either. Are packed-in PSUs ever worth using? Okay. Uh, you know, most of the time when you have a bundled power supply with a case, it's usually like a $50 case and it includes a power supply. That generally indicates that the power supply is unbelievably cheap. Uh, not as in bargain knockdown price or a closeout, but more often than not, you know, you're not looking at like a PC powered cooling supply. You're not looking at a really nice Entermax supply. You're not looking at, you know, we've, we've talked about a lot of great power supply units. The crew over at Hard OCP have done some really cool stuff where they've gone through and tested power supply units. And you rarely see anybody say, that $40 case, the bundled mother's you know, power supply with that is fantastic. Um, <laughs> the reality is like, you know, a few years ago, I literally bought a 30, it was like $25 on sale with a 300 watt power supply. That power supply ran pretty solid for two and a half, maybe three years before the bearing and the fan started to disintegrate. Uh, and then it burned itself out. You know, fortunately, it did not take out the rest of my PC in the process. Your mileage will almost absolutely vary. You know, will the power supply work? Probably. Will it do okay for, you know, your home server? 
probably are you going to use your home server to back up your precious memories the baby photos the tax information crucial data you know if you if you you know if you spend 20 bucks on a power supply that's brand new as part of a case i would probably make sure the contents of that home server are backed up uh, on say carbonite one of our occasional sponsors or crash plan or one of the other online servers so that just in case if it starts writing out some really nasty errors to the hard drive um, you have a backup for it but that's also because i've seen a couple of people really get scalded uh, using cheap power supplies. Uh, and also, you know, every time you build a, a home server, do yourself a favor, spend some money on a decent, uh, uh, a decent, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, uninterruptible power supply or UPS so that in the case of a, a uh, problem with a brownout or a blackout or the power goes out or, you know, lightning strikes in your neighborhood if you're in lightning country, uh, that your power supply and your hard drive and your CPU and everything else inside that computer has the best possible chance to survive that power anomaly. So, sorry, I get excited about PSUs. <laughs> no, it's, they, they are uh, the most important, most often overlooked item in a computer. Um, let's, let's make sure we get to this email here uh, from Michael about touchscreen notebooks. This week I watched my video card on my Alienware M17X burnout. It literally sparked and a puff of smoke came out of the vents. So that's all. That's a lot of fun. I can Ouch. buy a used video card off eBay for 200 bucks, send it to Dell for 450 or I can just wait for Ivy Bridge and pick up an Ultrabook. I want you guys to predict the future. With the release of Windows 8, will manufacturers start shipping notebooks and Ultrabooks with touch screens? Not necessarily in the convertible form factor, but just the touch screen on the computer. If I pick up an Ultrabook with the Ivy Bridge pre-Windows 8 release, do you think I will be missing out on a huge hardware refresh in October? I've played with Windows 8, and I think the Metro interface is clunky with a mouse and keyboard. So, uh, Patrick, predict the future for me. <laughs> well, um, if... You know, it's interesting. So the Ultrabook movement starts. Ultrabooks start getting sold. Uh, the biggest problem with Ultrabooks are consumers seem to want something bigger than the 13-inch monitor, right? So, okay, the Ultrabook spec or the Ultrabook idea gets expanded to include 14 and 15-inch monitors. And, hey, we expect or Intel expects 50% of the Ultrabooks sold this year to be um, uh, 14 or 15-inch, probably 15-inch monitors. Okay, mm. so looking at our big CES lecture, which was basically all about Intel moving the future of the computing interface forward. If you have Intel wanting to do things that require more CPU, like motion control and voice control and touch screens, and Microsoft building an entire operating system uh, that is optimized for a touchscreen environment, whether it's a four-inch phone or a 10-inch tablet or a you know 15-inch monitor. I would not be surprised if touchscreens don't show up on notebooks. That said, um, I think it's going to be probably initially single SKUs, high-end SKUs, more expensive monitors because I don't think anybody's made a really big breakthrough in touchscreen pricing. That's that's not. There's going to be, I think, a a, a, a price, a barrier to entry, cost-wise, to bringing touchscreen notebooks to everyone. You know, it's really interesting because, like, you know, Windows 8 they've announced there's three SKUs. Um, there's a bunch of stories rolling around the web today also that, you know, there's going to be, you know, Windows 8 is going to arrive on 32 new tablets. Uh, you know, September, October uh, seems to be the, the most, you know, tail end of September, beginning of October seems to be the kind of date that everybody assumes that Windows 8 is going to be released to manufacturers or September released to manufacturers, October hit the streets. And it's interesting because, you know, do, 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 do. I'm trying to think if, if anybody's wrote anything because everything is very kind of, you know, Intel tablets at this point, not much on the arm and not much speculation at this point about kind of alternative interface. You know, Connect for Windows should show up. Um, you know, I think it's going to be an experience. Do you like the idea of a notebook with a touch screen? It does Side not door. bother me. But I don't see it, you know, it, it's interesting. I, I recently uh, recently got to play around um, with one of the, the new Samsung televisions with their uh, gesture recognition and, and voice control built in. And it was really funny because I'm sitting there, high TV, power on. Spoink, the TV powers on. You know, high TV, volume up. Bink, the volume goes up. Volume down. Bink, the volume goes down. Um, changing channels, changing, you know. Hi TV, you know, a little icon pops up in the corner and I tell it to go yeah. to 
And, and, and that was a really interesting experience because, one, uh, voice recognition has always been a miserable, skull-banging frustration, um, especially like five or six years ago when you would, you know, there was this, this moment uh, involving myself, Jim Ladderback, an X10 control system and a lamp uh, that I wish I had the videotape for because, you know, Jim's kind of losing his mind. Fresh gear lamp on! <laughs> you know, and of course, it, it, that was after 10 minutes of trying to get the, the, the lamp to actually work. Nice. Um, so, you know, part of me is I'm excited. I want to see, you know, gesture-based controls work. I want to see voice controls work. I think it's neat that we have all this computational power that we can hurl at the computer in an attempt or at the operating system or the interface more accurately in an attempt to change how we interact with the computer and that'll interact, you know, change the way we interact with data and all of a sudden it's going to be minority report we're going to be wearing. Our computer is going to be in our gloves or embedded in our fingertips. We'll be able to reach out and control data. It's going to be unbelievably cool and amazing. Um, but the reality is, is most of this stuff doesn't work very well. And I'm typing and I'm used to using my thumb with my touchpad on my notebook. It can be really kind of Bringing up to poke things or to turn a page requires me to assimilate an entirely new kind of interaction with the computer. So, you know, am I like, oh, my goodness, touchscreens are going to be better than sliced bread? No, but, you know, if it's 100 bucks to get a, a touchscreen with a nice quality, you know, monitor and I could start, you know, doing multi-touch controls on the monitor of my notebook because I can see where, like, it might be nice to be able to edit photos by using my fingers on my touch screen on my notebook. That could be really cool. I could get into that. Mm. But I want to see them ship first. And none of them are, I don't think any of them are going to ship before Windows 8. I think if there were going to be a lot of them shipping, I think we would probably have already heard the noise. You know, maybe, okay, I'll say probably if, if we haven't heard any noise from, from notebook vendors by June, I don't really think they're going to show up. Um, you know, that may be pessimistic and, and I may suddenly find my inbox flooded with emails from Dell and HP and others, but I think it's going to be really interesting to watch the Windows 8 launch. Um, I think it's going to be Windows 8. I think it's going to be a flood of tablets, but I mostly think Microsoft desperately wants to figure out a way to start getting their enterprise customers to upgrade to a new operating system, uh, much more so than they're interested in touch screens on, on notebooks. But, um, that was a little long and wandering. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, that, I mean, we're supposed to predict the future. We can't predict the future in just a couple of words. I, I, I think what we will see is we'll definitely see a lot of Ivy Bridge notebooks whenever Ivy Bridge is released. I think you'll see some that claim to have, they'll have Windows 8 support, of course, when they come out. But um, I'm not a big fan of the idea of a, of a, of a locked screen, touch screen on your notebook, maybe detachables. You know, some people in the chat are talking about that, which which sounds like a much better idea. Uh, either a, a convertible flip over or um, a detachable screen type of uh, touch screen. But I think when Windows 8 actually ships, you will see, yes, you will see another wave of, of devices released that will be more touch centric. So if that's what you really want then it might be worth it for you to wait until the October, November timeframe uh, to see what devices come out. And uh, if you're not interested in that type of thing, then I don't really see the, the hang up and looking at a, at a initial release. I think in the next, you know, May, June timeframe, we're going to see a lot of new notebooks and new form factors and new chips kind of released uh, from both sides. So it, it will be, it will be interesting in the mobile market for sure. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can't argue with that one bit. Should we do one last story before we go? Yeah, this one this was kind of interesting. Uh, this came in from uh, Chung Yunam about fake drives. He's a frequent listener to Twitch. I got the following news from Loyat.net, a local IT hardware news portal forum, and thought uh, you were going to cover it in a recent podcast, but this is something that listeners of Twitch maybe want to want to be aware of. It hit the local scene over the recent. PC fair, a regular PC market builders and uh, a regular PC market for builders and system builders. The, and if you, uh, we have a link in there. It's not really a link, but if we can uh, paste that in, uh, the pictures really truly tell the story here. The picture says it all. Other sites report that uh, WD drive enclosures may have been used. So there are apparently different brands of these. Uh, what you're looking at is a external hard drive that is actually weights hot glued to a case with a USB flash drive attached to the USB port on the external drive. So they have weights in there so it feels like it's heavy, 
like there was a hard drive installed, but it's really just a flash drive being attached to the device. So, so wrong on so many levels. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, this was this obviously happened in uh, let's see, did they say Malaysia? Um, similar case in Malaysia uh, as well. So, you know. We don't have, we don't really tend to have these types of uh, open air markets or just kind of open markets for sale. I've been to Taiwan and been to several places where, had I come home with something like this, it would not have totally surprised me uh, <laughs> to begin with. You know, the first clue would have been when you plugged it in and it was supposed to be a, you know, one terabyte hard drive and it's actually a 256 meg <laughs> or something like that USB drive when you, yeah, or a US drive when you plug it in. But by that point, it's probably too late. These fairs pack up over the weekends. Everybody's gone, and you wouldn't have no kind of no recourse for that. Uh, I just thought it was funny it's, it's to see these weights kind of hot glued down. Yeah, yeah, it's a classic Christmas season scam when somebody gets a hold of a bunch of boxes for whatever the hot toy is: an Xbox 360, a PS3, a new generation of something, and they, um, you know, the, the the worst one I think I ever saw was I want to say when the I can't remember what came out, maybe a Nintendo Wii, and somebody, you know was auctioning off their Nintendo Wii box and the box was put yeah. down in like four type, you know, let me be abundantly at the bottom of like a giant list of descriptions of the Nintendo Wii and at the bottom it says, this is an auction for the box only and some poor, you know, kid or parents or gaming enthusiast bought, you know, paid like twice the retail price for the console to buy the box uh, off of eBay. <laughs> um, you know, I've you seen see him on people, Judge Judy. I, you know, I had a guy, it's, it's been a few years now, but I can remember having somebody try to sell me, you know, as I was walking across the parking lot, trying to sell me, uh, obviously not sealed, you know, kind of when you have sort of, you know, had been sealed on somebody's package sealer, it didn't look anything like it would come from the factory, uh, you know, and with a brick inside of it, you know, there's, there was a, a wave of those here in the Bay Area where people were selling, uh, you know, what they were claiming were camcorders or digital, you know, cameras, and basically people were, yeah, uh, you know, if you ask me, like, well, I open it up and we'll see what it looks like inside. No, 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 I can't do that. Then it'll, you know, be unsealed. You know, <laughs> and it's like that's my sign to be like, he's got a brick in that box. I got to go. <laughs> um, but it's it happens, and it's it's why you kind of always try to. You know, it's always nice to buy, uh, even at a fair. Like computer fairs are pretty much dead in the United States, but they used to be pretty regular. And it always used to be nice to either have somebody like other people knew or seen at seven other fairs or that had a brick and mortar store somewhere and would give you an actual receipt with the right. address of the brick and mortar store. Um, because there are scumbags out there and they will try to take you for everything they can because they are weasels and their souls are hollow. Um, <laughs> Doesn't get any more serious than that, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> their souls are hollow, much like their fake hard drive enclosures. <laughs> so what's coming up with PC Per, man? What's got you excited? Outside of waiting for NVIDIA's announcement of the next GPU, you may or may not actually be able to buy at retail. I would say that. And uh, obviously, <laughs> we're doing a lot of processor testing for a reason. We're probably, you know, it's not a secret. Ivy Bridge is going to come out soon, so we're going to talk about that, uh, I think, next week. Yeah, I should be able to. Um, so we'll be able to talk about that performance differences, overclocking differences, platform differences, that types of things. Um, we've seen a lot of leaks and that kind of stuff. So I don't think anybody's going to be super surprised, but that is what my focus will be on between now and next week. I will also be moving temporarily to Austin starting next week. For how long? Three months. Um, Whoa. but back and forth. So, uh, that'll be interesting. We'll see how that goes. My wife is a nurse. She took a traveling nursing position at uh, Dale Children's Hospital in, in downtown Austin. So we're leaving. I don't really know when we're leaving next week. We'll have to see. Um, I'd barbecue. imagine I'll be doing Twitch from a hotel room, I guess is what I'm telling you <laughs> on, on the, on the drive down. So uh, I will be the remote guy then. Uh, but yeah, so that's, Processor review and packing for that is what uh, will be going on for the next week. Nice. We've got uh, one of my favorite cell phone experts on Monday or the Tuesday edition of uh, TechSell next week. So I was just saying PC Mag is going to be talking about what's going on in terms of the new releases on Android and some of the exciting stuff that's going on inside. Uh, this is sort of jockeying back and forth. Um, 
that's been really interesting to watch, especially looking at uh, uh, Verizon and AT&T battling back and forth for 4G rollout in the United States. I also want to, just for fun before I go, poke fun at uh, iOS 5.1, uh, which puts a little AT&T 4G, I forgot to do this the other week, uh, you know, right up next there to your fake bars is your AT&T, and then it, it's 4G now. Right. Um, oh, yeah, of course. Because that's... 4G, even though it's not 4G, which I just think is the most irritating thing I've seen in years. <laughs> but uh, yeah, actually, it uh, should be a fun interview next week. So if you're into cell phones, you got a cell phone question, fire it out to me, Patrick at revision3.com or Texilla at revision3.com. And we'll get that in there. I think that's about it for this edition of Twitch. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Stroud. See you next week.